Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, the podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne, and I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, Elder Canada at Redeemer Fellowship. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. What's going on? Nothing. Just uh, checking things out, getting ready to go. Getting ready to go where? Well, we're going. We're going up to uh, Minneapolis. Yeah, we Actually, are. Actually, this drops. We're in Minneapolis. Yeah, when this drops, we will be, mm. we will already have been hanging out. Partying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in like a in like a bad sense party, but you know, is there a bad sense? Well, of there's party? a really bad sense of party. Yes. No, I don't, I don't yeah, understand. Yeah, you. I been, come to party. You've been out of the world a little too long, I think, because <laughs> when most people in the world talk about partying, they mean something different. Yeah, man, we're uh, right now. We are probably having a lot of fun hanging out, hearing teaching, fellowshipping. Mm. Mm. Um, in fact, if they're listening to this on Monday morning, we're hanging out tonight, aren't we? Yeah, tonight we are hanging out. So we don't know where, so we you've got to check our social media. Yep. Because tonight, probably around 7 o'clock. We're going to be somewhere. Maybe St. Paul. Yeah. Be well, ready. We might be in St. Paul. Just at, be ready to uh, get an Uber. What is, what's it called? Grand Stogies? Stogies, Stogies on, Grand? on Grand? That might be where we're going to be. That might be where we go. So Depends. Just 7 o'clock, be ready to hang out if you want to hang out with the Jofo. And, because uh, I'm coming out, so you better get that party started. I don't even know the lyrics to that that's song. It, that's but I do know that's Pink. And she is singing the national anthem for the uh, Super Bowl. Oh, well, good job, Joe. See good what job. I know? See what I know? Yep, you know things. I do. I know a lot of things. <laughs> so um, what are we doing today? Uh, we're going to be talking biblical theology, except we're going to be doing it a little differently. Yep. So we, we, we said at the beginning of the year that uh, we want to push biblical theology throughout 2018. We want to encourage you guys. Yeah. To uh, if you're unfamiliar with biblical theology, we want you to get into it. If you are familiar with biblical theology, we want you to go deeper. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're we're trying to um, not only encourage each other, yeah, as friends and ministers at the church, but um, we want to uh, encourage you guys as well. So uh, we're gonna today, and uh, you guys already know this if you've been listening to the podcast. We're gonna start. Uh, talking through a particular book, yeah. um, because this idea of this issue of biblical theology is something that is starting to get more appreciation and some more coverage, but there's still, there, most people don't really know what it is. There's so, a bit of a misunderstanding in, in how we we uh, approach it, I would say. Right, and so like people seem to know in most evangelical churches, or in a lot of churches, that many Christians know that systematic theology is a... Is a is an understanding of scripture. Okay. Bro. Okay. I don't know what that was. That me. That was your phone. Okay. Yeah. That's yep. uh, there's a church alert going mm-hmm. on. Not a not a fire alarm though. So yeah, that's yeah. nice for a change. Mm-hmm. Um, so systematic theology um, is an organization that is very logical of the various uh, subjects yeah. topics yeah. that run throughout all of scripture. Brings it all together in a systemized uh, form. But biblical theology is different than that, right? Yeah, I mean, I would think uh, with biblical theology, we're, you're kind of looking at the unity of Scripture. How does right. how does everything tie in together right. uh, from from the garden uh, to what we read mm-hmm. in in Revelation? Right. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at those those dominant themes that run through all of Scripture. Yeah. Or what is the thread or the threads that, like you said, tie together? I like that. Um, and this is not in conflict or contrary to mm. systematic theology. It's complementarian. Yeah, it's, well, it's Com- complementary. complementary. It's complementary, Com- yes. Complementary. We are complementary. Complementary com- compilations. It's, uh, yeah, it's like continental. Com- Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you can kind of take from here and there, and it's, you know, like yeah, at a continental it, breakfast. Like a complementarian kind of, breakfast? That's, that's pretty <laughs> much it. Just kind of pick and choose what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not what this is. Okay, it's let me tell you. you. Choose what you want. How good was the breakfast we were having at that hotel in Wellington, New Zealand? How good were those breakfasts? That breakfast. Oh, I have man. not had as good of a breakfast right, so as seriously. far as at hotels. Yeah. Like Jimmy, when Jimmy travels. Okay, come on now. No, when Jimmy travels, you go, like you don't stay at the Motel 6 where I stay. No, or, no. or the because red it, roof in that I see you going okay, into. Because because it's a company trip, and so the company puts you up. Even if it's a company trip, I ain't going no red roof in. No, that's what I'm saying. A company puts you up. No, nah, but even if I'm not. Oh, then you're still going to. I'm, okay. I'm not going to you. Jim, Jim, I, I, so, so Jimmy went with me one, so, somewhere, and we stayed at like a Holiday Inn, and he's like, oh, man, I can't wait for breakfast oh, don't do downstairs this, don't do this. because I'm gonna, I want some eggs Benedict. <laughs> and I with said, salmon. I said, they ain't have no 
eggs Benedict at the Holiday Inn. You're gonna get you're gonna get a frozen scramble like pancake egg, and uh, it's gonna be terrible. He was you were horrified. I was but hor- I'm like people live like this. Oh yeah, that, that's what you know. But boy, I knew it was good when Jimmy was going back for seconds in Wellington at that oh, place because we well, kept going back. Yeah, it was it was really good. It was so good. That, like, I miss eggs that. were perfect. The eggs and they were like the orange eggs. yolks. Yes. They were well, like yes, fresh yes. eggs, not like our eggs here. Mm. Anyway. Anyways, so what have we been talking about? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Biblical theology. So it's not. It's it 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 works alongside. It's complementary to systematic theology. Right. And so the book that we wanted to kick it off with um, is a book that's a, a little beyond. Um, Hamilton's book, yeah, um, yeah, and a little more specific. We want to talk through Gospel and Kingdom by Graham Goldsworthy. So why are we doing this instead of other works like, like, uh, like Voss? Yeah, Voss's biblical theology. Yeah. Uh, well, because Voss would bore some people. Uh, it's a little dry. It's still something you and I are going it's through. Very just, good. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Voss Joe and I great. are going through it personally. But as far as on, yes, the, the, this this is a great introductory level book. Uh, and Graham Goldsworthy stuff is awesome. This book in particular is really good um, because he's going to he's going to help us to see uh, not just the value of the Old Testament, yeah. but how to read the Old Testament. And and the reason this is important because in biblical theology we want to see the themes, the threads, the truth, the unity of Scripture. Uh, we, we want to see the arc that right. goes through. Yeah, right. So. Um, Jimmy, what, let's just get to the like when he wrote this book. Yeah, um, he he wrote it. He had an agenda, right? Yeah, he had a he had an he had aim. a purpose. He had a, it was a very purpose driven book. Purpose driven book. Dang it, that's what I was going to say. You stole my joke. <laughs> so, what is the aim of 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 uh, Gospel and Kingdom by Graham Goldsworthy? Yeah, I mean, if you if uh, he kind of lays it out just at the end of the introduction. Is that uh, right? what page? In case people are following along. Yeah, if you're following along, it's on page ten, the last paragraph there, uh, and he says this the. This book aims to provide a basic structure upon which to build a more confident use of the Old Testament and thus of the Bible as a whole. It is intended to help Christians cross the deep ravine that separates them from the original meaning of the biblical text. It does not tell the whole story of biblical theology, but offers an invitation to begin the exciting task of reading the Bible as a living whole. That's gold. That's gold. Fact, that you know what? That's gold worthy. Oh, <laughs> I saw you. I saw you trying like, to go like, for it. I had it. Uh, reach out, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shop. So I'm gonna shoplift the pooty joke. Yeah, you just kind of took that joke from me. So, um, yeah, right. The, the, if we're going to understand the whole of Scripture, if yeah. we're going to have a biblical theology, we have to understand the Old Testament. You can't skip it. And, and uh, not just understand it. I, I, I like the word that he used there. What's that? To build a more confident use. Because mm. that's just, there's a, there's a lot of misunderstandings. There's right. a lot of misuse and abuse when it comes to the Old Testament. And it's and I think for people, it's they're, mel, they're well-meaning. Oh, yeah. They're just... There, it, so yeah, I think that's part of it is is a correct use, but then others that have shied away from the Old Testament that yeah. stick towards the New Testament to be more confident in what they are reading. Right, and he talks about this, right, that the New Testament is closer to us than the Old Testament. Yeah, um, in time. Yeah, right, and so and the issues that are addressed in the New Testament are church issues. Yeah, so it's it's not as big of a gap to breach, whereas the Old Testament you're talking. Israel, you know, pre-Israel, you're yeah. theocracy. Yep. I mean, it's there's there's a lot there, and so there's, the gap is a bit bigger. So then, why is it why is it important then to read the Old Testament? Because he's kind of focusing yeah. on that, right? Like this That's, confident use of the Old Testament. Yeah. Why yeah. then is it important to read the Old Testament? Yeah, and, and he, he talks about this like that that before you can really get into why you should read it. Um, we, we need to first say why people don't read it, right? Because right. a lot of people don't read it. And on, on the one hand, you've got some people that don't read it just because it's it's too foreign. They're just like, I just don't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. It's confusing. Um, I can't say Maher Shalal Hashbaz. So uh, how am I even going to know who he is? Is that the same guy as Melchizedek? I, I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. So they just get overwhelmed. Um, but there are... The, the, the one real reason that people don't read the Old Testament, the dominant okay. reason is bad theology. And that's just, oh, yeah. They, they, they have a wonky, warped theology that does not allow them or encourage them mm-hmm. to go deep into oh, yeah. the, the largest section of the revelation of God oh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that he's given us. And I mean, I mean I've heard people say, I think for an, as an example, I've, I mean, I've had people tell me 
that the New Testament is like this improvement mm-hmm. on the right. Old Testament, right? right? right. Yeah. So they kind of pit one against the other. Right. And how many, you know, if, if you talk, especially to people outside of the church, sometimes people inside the church, yeah. they'll talk about the God of the Old Testament yeah. was a God of uh, wrath. wrath. And yeah. the God of the New Testament is a God of mercy. Right. Okay. And it's like, really? Because the God of the New Testament is the like, same God of the Old. Well, he killed Ananias and Sapphira. For oh, lying. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they, they lied and they died in church. Mm-hmm. So that that doesn't sound too merciful. And then the God of the Old Testament, how many years was he patient with yep. Israel when they were yep. like worshiping false gods? So um yeah, that is a I mean that's a more liberal approach to theology. Yeah. Um where we have two competing theologies. And no, the New Testament is not an improvement on the old in terms of the revelation of God. It is giving us more revelation of God. Yeah, yeah. It's yes. building upon what has already been stated by God. Right, right. So if you you can't understand the more unless you first understand the less, right? You have to understand the the the, the smaller pieces of yeah, revelation yeah, 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 if you're yeah. really going to appreciate the fuller revelation in the New Testament. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think so. And then the other thing, so like you said that the New Testament some people believe some people, it's an improvement on improvement, the old. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, other people, like some dispensationalists... Uh, oh, we got to call them out. Old school on, dispensationalists, Dispies. school fieldian types. That the mm, old yeah, test- Moody Bible Institute worthy. Yes, well, continue. Well, you know, just, you know. <laughs> um, hey, listen, I graduated from Moody, so, uh, mm. don't, be so throwing, things, don't be throwing shade. Yeah, so the things you believe, continue. By the way... Uh-oh, don't... No, I'm just saying, like, since you bring a, it up, yeah. I think there's a couple positions open there. Well, there's two positions open right now. I don't know. All I know is... I know... I think it's a fit. I mean, did okay. What were the positions? I don't. Uh, okay, president. Okay, that's and me. And chief operating officer. Oh, that's definitely that, that's you. Me. Dude. I feel like Team Jofo. Team Jofo. Team Jofo. Twenty eighteen. Moody. Moody. Yeah, that's um, team. Team Jofo running MBI. Can you imagine the fun we could have? Can you imagine the havoc? No, dude, listen. They no. have a whole new like media center. No, no. Our podcast game would go. <laughs> oh global. my goodness! No. Okay. No. So, all right. Anyways, well, um, the you, donors so, would split. Oh, the donors. Yeah, no, 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 no. I don't think you get to vote for the president of Moody and the COO. I don't think. I think they appoint you. Oh well. Uh, yeah. Team okay. Jofo. <laughs> listen. All we need is a cigar lounge. And we're good. And you know what? There's got yeah, there's got to be a cigar that's, that's lounge the only thing up we in need that for up in Kroll Hall. There's got to be a cigar lounge. up Oh, there. I think you had one up there when you were a student. No, nope, I never broke those rules. Oh, you never broke never those, broke those never rules. Bro- not the tobacco. Never, not the tobacco rule. Never, ne- never, because you would never break a tobacco rule if you were not supposed to smoke somewhere, right? Not when I was a Moody Bible Institute <laughs> student. I never did. Now, when I graduated, when I walked across the aisle, I did have cigars in my breast pocket. Yes. But, <laughs> all right, all right. So dis- some dispensationalists argued back in the day that the Old Testament was essentially for the Jews, and yeah. not just the Old Testament, but like Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> a mm-hmm. lot of the things that Jesus said. That's for the Jews. The New Testament's for the church. You don't need to worry about the Old Testament. That ain't for you. You're a parenthetical people. You're the Gentiles that are just going to be, you know, God's doing doing this stuff with you for a little while. But the Jews are the real people of God, and, like, that's for them. So there's some wonky stuff. Hold on. I need you to clarify that Sermon on the Mount thing, right? Because we're talking about dispensationalists talking about the Old Testament for the Jews, but— Okay, so no— But but, but you know what I mean? It's in the New Testament. Okay, so when I was at Moody, I was taught that the Sermon on the Mount— like, this is a dispensational perspective. The Sermon on the Mount was Jesus— preaching to the Jews and um, trying to give them the kingdom, they would reject it. And so gotcha. that Sermon on the Mount is not for the church today. It's for the, it's for the Jews. Gotcha. So th- this, is a, this is an error in thinking it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad hermeneutic. Um, and so yeah. we're saying that um, some people don't invest in the, in the Old Testament because they think it's, a, it's an improper picture of God. Other people don't read it because they think, well, it, maybe it's, it's, it's not for the church today. Maybe it was for the Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are people that do read it, right? There are people that, that read the Old Testament, yeah, they get yeah. into it. But for some of them, though, they, they read it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's easy. We've all done that. And yeah. there are some systems that really encourage a misreading um, of the Old Testament. Well, like, Goldsworthy talks about that, right? The, the allegorical system, particularly uh, in the Middle Ages. Right, right. So he breaks it down. And there's a couple of examples, but what's the basic like way that they do it? Uh, the literal meaning. So you read it, you read the, you read the text in the Old yep. Testament, you got the literal meaning. So what happened in right there? Context time, and everything. Yeah. All right. Uh, the moral meaning to the human soul. Right. So, all right, got that. Now there's a deeper meaning now. Yeah, deeper right. meaning that. Uh, the allegorical reference to the church. Oh, so it's even deeper. It's even deeper. It's extending beyond the individual to the church in the new covenant. Okay. That's right. And then the eschatological reference to the heavenly realities. 
all right, this is now it's just getting to be a pain. What? I don't want to do all that. That's that's too much. I, I ain't nobody got time for that kind of a hermeneutic. I don't want to do that. So and now that's not that's not really in vogue today. People don't do a lot of that. They do allegorize a lot though. Yeah. Um, you know, and they'll over spiritualize a lot of the things that are happening in the Old Testament, and that's not a really healthy way to go about it. But the dominant way. Jimmy, you tell me, what's the dominant way that people misuse the Old Testament and those Old Testament stories, David yeah. and Goliath? What's, what do they do? It's just, uh, just this moralistic teaching. Right. They moralize the stories, yeah. right? So that you've got heroes and you've got um, uh, villains and you want to be like David. You don't want to be like those unbelieving Israelites. Yeah. So most churches doing this, when they, and, and it's, uh, it's not just Old Testament, it's even New Testament, you know, uh, the Gospels and the Book of Acts, uh, they will take a story, right, a historical account, yeah. and the the deepest that they go, which is not deep at all, is instead of showing us who God is and how this how this story ultimately points us to Jesus, they find the hero and they say, "You too can, can be, be like a, that. You can be this hero. You and, yeah, you could be David. Right. So you be, need, you go, should go conquer follow. your Goliath." Right, so what, on pages uh, uh, 25 and 26? 25 and 26. Why don't you read that? Uh, that yeah, don't tell me what to do. You read, I'll decide. You read A. Go I'll ahead. read, I'm, hey, I'm going to read A. All right, go. All right, so on, page, granted. on, yep, page, 25. on page 25, Bottom. he calls it the character study approach. Um, and I'm going to, I don't know if it'll be out yet. No, it won't be out yet. If, if you, uh, nah, never mind. I was going to. All right. I was I was going to encourage you guys to read something, but actually we're going to post it on the blog yeah, in, we'll post in it a few blog. weeks. Yeah. So, All right. We must not view... Man, I can't have a hard time reading here. I know, it is dark, it's dark in here. It's really we dark like here. it dark when we record. I don't right, want to look at Joe's ugly mug. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> All right, go. There are two dangers to avoid in regard to the historical narrative. Number one here. We must not view these recorded events as if they were a mere succession of events from which we draw little moral lessons or examples for life. Much that passes for application of the Old Testament text to the Christian life is only moralizing. It consists almost exclusively in observing the behavior of the godly and the godless, admittedly against a backdrop of the activity of God, and then exhorting people to learn from these observations. That is why the character study, quote-unquote, is a favorite approach to Bible narrative, the life of Moses, the life of David, the life of Elijah, and so on. There is nothing wrong with the character studies as such— we are to learn by others' examples. But such character studies all too often take the place of more fundamental aspects of biblical teaching. Yeah. Paradoxically, they may even lead us away from the basic foundations of the gospel. Certainly, we do not solve the problem by using the allegorical method and turning every historical detail into a prefiguring of Christ without regard to the whole structure of the Bible. Mm. So, um, you know, he's, he's saying, listen, I'm not saying that, uh, that Old Testament characters never serve as a moral example. Correct. That it, it's not that that's never the case. But if that's all that you do, if you're, you're, then all you're doing is giving people law, commands, um, imp, uh, imperatives, and you're not giving them the hope, the promises, the indicatives of the gospel. Mm. So this, this succession of events, moralistic thing, is a... Is a no bueno, right? No Jimmy? bueno, no. And so the second danger, uh, page 26 there in the middle, starting, uh, it says B. Uh, we must guard against a too ready acceptance of the example of biblical characters, whether good or bad, as a source of principles of the Christian life. Mm. If we concentrate on how David saved Israel from Goliath, on what response Elijah made to the threats of Jezebel, on where Saul showed the chinks in his moral armor, as examples to follow or to avoid, then we have reduced the significance of these people to the lowest common denominator. This approach easily obscures any other unique characteristics that may be part of Revelation. So you're kind of right. missing the whole point of right. what we're talking about here. Yeah, you see the characters at the most. Like you see the characters, but you you miss the actual story that's leading to something grand. And something... you see you see the hand of God. Right in the midst of a kind of moving forward, this plan of salvation and redemption for God's people. Right, right. Okay, so some people don't read it. They got bad theology. Yeah. Some people do read it, and we, we interpret it the wrong way. We use it in the wrong way. So um, why, let, let's, before we ask how should we read it, and that's really what this whole book is about, mm -hmm. why should we read the Old Testament? He talks about this on pages 18 and 19. Yeah, 18 and 19. He starts there. I mean, the heading is, uh, is the Old Testament for all Christians? 
The most compelling reason for Christians to read and study the Old Testament lies in the New Testament. The New Testament witnesses to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is the one in whom and through and through whom all the promises of God find their fulfillment. They can only these promises can only be understood. Right. Uh, Sorry, I just lost my place. These yeah. promises are only to be understood from the Old Testament. The fulfillment of the promises can only be understood only in the context of the promises themselves. And so reading the Old Testament, looking at right. the promises that God has given God's people, yep. we see it being fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Right, which is why like the New Testament doesn't make much sense apart from the Old. He continues saying the New Testament presupposes a knowledge of the yeah. Old Testament. Everything that is a concern to the New Testament writers is part of one redemptive history to which the Old Testament witnesses. The New Testament writers cannot separate the person and work of Christ, nor the life of the Christian community, from this sacred history, which has its beginning in the Old Testament. Mm. It, it, which is why, as he continues, the New Testament is alluding to or quoting quite often right. the Old Testament. It's right. assuming and presuming that we know the story behind that. And, and so there, there, are, there are some of those New Testament books that are much more Gentile, like Luke. Yeah. Right? So Luke, written to a more Gentile audience, is, is like, I don't know, it's like Jew light. Right. It's like, oh it's like, goodness. no, I'm just saying like, it's, it's, it's Jew light. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have this, this oh readiness, gosh. this emphasis. Oh I don't gosh. mean that in a bad way. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's not Jew heavy. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. What are you talking about? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a descriptor. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag Jew light. Oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because, because when you read Matthew, yeah, it's Matthew. so Jewish. It's so Jewish. Like there's so much fulfillment of, of scripture and prophecy and all of that. But so there are these, there are books where you can tell that the author is going out of his way to yeah. present things in a way where the gap that needs to be bridged isn't as significant. But the yes. vast majority of the New Testament is Jew heavy. Like it's very yeah. Jewish. It's, it's, it's steeped um, in, in so Old Testament knowledge. So it's important for us to understand that right. as Gentiles, as people that have been removed from that setting and that culture and that context, right. to look back and see, okay, what is it that it's presupposing its listeners would understand? Wait a minute. We're not Gentiles. We're not Gentiles? No. We're non-Jewish. Yeah, dude, in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. Oh, yeah. oh I got you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the question is, how, <laughs> how do we read the Old Testament? Like, yeah. what? And, and that's what the whole book is about. Like this, And this book is not big. This is a little book. Yeah. So this is an introduction. It's going to get you going on how to read the Old Testament, how to make the most of it, see biblical theology. Um, how do what is what does uh, Graham Goldsworthy tell us? Like, what's the how should we begin looking at the Old Testament? Yeah, I mean, he talks about you know that the Reformation rediscovered what was missing uh, in the most popular models uh, of hermeneutics for the time. Things right, like, right, you right. know, medieval and, and things like that. Because right? they were they were heavy on allegory. Yes. When you read Calvin, he does not play. Mm -mm. You read Cal Calvin's commentaries are seriously rooted in the original context That's and right. the author's intent and what's going on. But he does more with it than that. So, I mean, he kind of, uh, he talks about the reformers maintain that. Whoa, this wait, is so, wait, wait. What? Oh, what page, page 17. Okay, dude, you got to tell people what right, page, my bad. On, page so 17. Know, you, give them a chance. Now take a beat. Uh, They're going to be flipping. Like 17. There you go. Now I'm going to jump from the middle to the bottom. All right. So uh, here we go. Uh, so the reformers maintain that salvation is a matter of grace alone by Christ alone through Faith alone. Um, and faith alone meant that the only way for the sinner to receive salvation is by faith, whereby the righteousness of Christ is imputed, credited to the believer. Now, last paragraph. What had what had this got to do with the Old Testament? It meant that the Reformers were establishing a method of biblical interpretation in which the natural historical sense of the Old Testament has significance for Christians because of its organic relationship mm -hmm. to Christ. Yep. God's grace seen in his dealings with Israel is part of a living process which comes to its climax in his work of grace, the gospel, that is in the historical events of the Christ, who is Jesus of Nazareth. Just as it is important to assert that this Old Testament sacred history or salvation history must be interpreted by the word Jesus Christ, it is also important to recognize that the gospel is God acting in history, more specifically through the history of yeah. Jesus. So the, to, to read it is yeah. to read it with an understanding of what's happening, right? 
uh, in that original situation, yes. in its historical context, but with an eye towards the New Testament. Correct. In other words, to fully understand the, 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 the full meaning of what's happening in the Old Testament, you need the New Testament. Yeah. So, I mean, even like, let's take David and Goliath. That's a popular one. I know it is. But like, you know, how then would someone look at that? Because the moralistic teaching, the character study teachings would be focusing on you are David, conquer your Goliath. And that's even what we do. Like, you, not we, but I'm talking about a lot of the church does right. in Sunday school with children and things like that. People kind of identify thing. with the heroes. It's just natural, right? When yeah. you go and see an action movie, you walk out and you, you're like, you're all pumped because it's like, oh, I saw this action movie. And you imagine yourself maybe in that position or in that yeah, role. Yeah. What would you do? So when somebody tells the story of David and Goliath, a little dude, a, I mean, a, a very good looking small guy, kind of like me. No, and, no, he's just uh, small. Uh, he's small and good he's looking. He's the runt. He was good looking. He's the runt. David was, David was hot. So if it wasn't you then. It was like me. And, uh, and so this little guy takes on the giant and, and just kill and beheads him, which is, yeah. people don't talk about that. That's pretty brutal. So, um, yeah, it, uh, you're right. People like to say, okay, so you see how everybody was afraid? David was, but David stood up. Uh, for the honor of God and did what was right, and God gave him the victory. Mm-hmm. What's your What's your Goliath, Jimmy? Do you have a Goliath in your life that you need to chop the head off of and hold <laughs> up for everybody to look at? Um, so yeah, that's the common thing. And I think a better understanding is you can look at this in a number of different ways. Uh, what is God doing here? Well, He is preserving His people. Yep. He's He is God is yeah, David didn't have like David wasn't the man here. Mm-hmm. Um, God preserved his people from utter destruction. Why is that important? Because from them, from them comes uh, the Christ. Comes the Christ, yeah. And then, okay, so then it, when we look at Israel and we look at these characters, what, I mean, goodness, if you're going to make any kind of parallel, it's more like, well, David is really a type of Christ. Yeah. You know, David is a king who rules, who conquers evil. And though he was a sinner who screws up terribly and makes mistakes, he is still a type of Christ who pointed to one who would come, who would defeat our enemies. So David is like Jesus. We are not like David. We are like Israel, cowering and afraid and in need of a deliverer. Yep. So I think that's a better better way to look at it uh, than than the the moral example uh, or the moralistic uh, approach to in interpreting the scripture. So what we have here is uh, is sort of a just a, an introduction to this book, right? Uh, what this book is about is how to understand the Old Testament and why it's important for us to read the Old Testament. Because apart from it, the New Testament is not going to be as clear as it could be because the New Testament is so often commenting and building upon yeah. the promises uh, and the revelation that is in the old. There are themes and threads and truths that unite all of Scripture that run through both. So if we're going to make the most of the word that God has given us, we have to understand both Testaments. And and by the way, hey, hey, preachers, mm. you know you can preach the Old Testament? Uh-uh. Well, look, all I know, I, I, I just saying, do, well, why don't we do a 40-week thing on Genesis? Uh, no, uh, don't do on that. Genesis. Uh, how about a, how about a, uh, are you calling out Michael Beck? Did you just oh, call out Michael Beck? I forgot about oh that. Oh my gosh, you just called out Michael Beck. <laughs> no, like I, I did, I did a, a year in Exodus, man. So that's cool. Like, listen, mm. we do a lot of Old Testament here. We go back and forth, Old Testament, yeah, New Testament, yeah. and people love it. But like, I don't know. I always kind of find it weird when I hear like this guy is like an, like the 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 best modern expositor of the word, and he's only ever preached the New Testament. Like, what's up with that, yeah, yeah, John yeah. MacArthur? Like, why, oh. why, why don't you ever preach the Old Testament? I don't understand. Oh. I'm not hating. I'm just asking. It's a question. Oh, well, you know, New Testament's an improvement on the old. Oh, I guess so. Mm. Liberal. (laughs) Hey, BJ, you ought to call that guy out for being a liberal. (laughs) All right, man. Um, So uh, we want people to, so we're kind of teasing this a little bit, giving you a taste of it, because we're going to go through this over the next few weeks. Um, So now, you know what we're reading. You've got a taste for it now. Get that book. Get that book. Get the book. Got a link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Get the book. And you can get the trilogy. So you can actually buy the trilogy. All three in one, and the page numbers line up with the single version. Well, for the first book. Yeah, for the first book, (laughs) of course. So, and that's what we're going through. So, you'll be fine. You can get that. You can get it as a PDF, what do you call it? An e-book or something? E-book, yeah, yeah. Um, So, I mean, yeah, make sure, uh, let us know your thoughts. You know, uh, just use the hashtag learn with Jofo. Let us know. Is it learning with Jofo? Learn with. Learn with Jofo. Hashtag 
Learn, Learn with, with Jofo. Jofo. Got it. Let us know uh, what you've been, you know, reading or, you know, the sections that have really been powerful to you. Yeah, don't let us know what you've been reading. Yeah, I, I don't be care boring. about that. I, yeah. don't, I just want to know what about this. Yeah, pull out, <laughs> pull out the good stuff. Pull out the good stuff and let us know your thoughts. From this book. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo. Yeah, and out. then on Facebook Twilight slash Doctrine like and Devotion. Make any sense. Uh, you can head over to the website, DoctrineVotion.com. Listen, you can contact now. us. You can <laughs> sign up for the email blast. Man, that website looks good, doesn't it? The new website looks real good. Oh my gosh, Pastor Brian Malcolm, mm. you are a genius. He did really good, really, really oh, good. Hey, Reform Pub, now that you're back. Um, Reform, yeah, Reform Re- Podcast. Reform Podcast? Yeah. Hey, maybe you guys should get, get rid of your janky website and uh, hire Brian Malcolm. Maybe he could do something for you. Maybe he could do something for you. And so if you want to write uh, for Dr. Devotion, you want to go to drdevotion.com slash submissions, mm-hmm. and there you can... Uh, Get all the information that you need. We've got the Doctor Devotion Conference on the Spirit and the Church. Oh, people are registering. They for are that registering, thing, man. man. We got it's lots be a of people coming. Great conference. Pretty, uh, actually, by now we should have the link out for the hotels yep. for the discount. Yep. Uh, oh, just wait, still waiting to hear back from from them on that. Okay, so here's we're getting ready to release the schedule. By now, the schedule might be up. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But um, so you'll, you'll know what the topics are. Um, it's going to be on the Holy Spirit and the Church. Uh, we're going to do Q and A, but we're also going to do a live recording of Doctrine and Devotion during the conference. Wait, we're we're doing that? Oh, we're doing uh, that. Oh yeah, yep, it's done deal. It's going to be all good. All right, all right. We People got some, like that. People I know, always I know, ask us to do it. I know, I know, I know. We got some exciting things though on the horizon. We can't talk about it yet. Nope. But we just like to let you know that there's something you can't know that we know. Yeah, and maybe, and soon you will know. Yeah. You know who else knows? Uh, Steve McCoy. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> We got, uh, we got the original Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday blog post. Quit on saying Fresh Wednesday. Pod, everybody. We made that up. We call it a Fresh Pod. Hey, you can get they, you ought, they ought to get the T-shirt. What banter t-shirt? of Truth. Oh, that banter. T-shirt is going to sell out, so you better order that T-shirt. Banter of Truth. Head on the website drvocha.com. You can hit the store, grab yourself the tea. Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday blog post on Wednesdays. Video content on Fridays. Later. Later. Later.